Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. It's no secret that when it comes to non-registered financial advice that you can come across online through sites like YouTube, Reddit, or uh, TikTok, you have to be incredibly careful. Not only might the information be uh, inappropriate for your situation or slightly misrepresented, it can be blatantly wrong or even harmful. But there's been a long-standing issue when it comes to registered financial advice that we've recently seen more discussion around, thanks in part to a Reddit post that recently circulated, a CBC News investigation here in Canada, and even here on YouTube with a video posted by Benjamin Felix, another Canadian portfolio manager uh, YouTuber, uh, with the issue at the heart of all of this being the conflicts of interests and at time just blatant bad advice you can get from registered financial advisors specifically those that come from bank branches. You see, while it's probably true that you won't get the yellow stock picks or wild cryptocurrency predictions, we've nonetheless seen a number of examples of bank advisors putting clients into products and services not appropriate for their situation for the sake of making the bank more money. Now, this isn't exactly a shocker. In Canada, banks are known for their high fees and other issues. And in the US, obviously, Wall Street, never had an amazing reputation. Outside of certain profit motives contributing to the 2008 financial crisis, you might remember back in 2018 when Wells Fargo had its asset size capped after a scandal involving the unauthorized cross-selling and opening of client accounts. But the mentioned Reddit post and CBC investigation really brought to light how bad it can get at times. And while the post specifically involved Canadian banks, it's a pretty common problem across countries. Now, personally, as someone who works in the finance industry and, and has been well aware of these problems for some time, it's something I've always found incredibly disheartening about finance. I've always viewed the financial advisor role as something that should be akin to a medical professional, uh, whereby you have a well-educated and experienced expert getting to know a client situation and making recommendations accordingly. In other words, someone who owes the client a fiduciary duty, similar to a doctor, whereby you must put the client's interests above your own. Uh, but unfortunately, here in Canada and in many other countries, that's not always the case. There are many advisors who do have that legal responsibility, and even at a bare minimum, all advisors in Canada and the US are required to ensure a degree of suitability with whatever they're selling to their clients. But the idea of the fiduciary duty only exists with certain types of registrations, which aren't that common with bank branches. Quite frankly, a lot of advisor roles are really just structured to be sales positions, with many having explicit sales targets and commissions for getting clients into certain products, which is a pretty severe conflict of interest and why I wanted to discuss it in today's video. Because while I've always encouraged individuals seeking out explicit financial advice to reach out to a financial professional, and I still stand by that, it is important to acknowledge the shortcomings that come with some registered financial advice and the important point that not all advisors are created equal. And it's important to be able to differentiate between the positions to understand some of the common practices and the steps you can take to better protect yourself. Now, before going any further, I do want to acknowledge that as mentioned, Ben Felix likewise did a video on this exact topic and I highly recommend you check it out. He brings up some really interesting research reports on this topic, uh, but I nonetheless want to cover myself, even though some of the sources I cover will be redundant with his because A, I was already working on it uh, when his video came out, so how dare you, Ben? And B, because I think it's a really important topic that deserves attention. I know I've always harped on the not financial advice you can come across online. That doesn't absolve the problems we see with traditional finance and registered financial advice. And I think it's important to shine a light on these issues so that people go into it with a more level playing field and hopefully we can see some change over time. But with all that out of the way, let's hop into it. And we'll begin with the Reddit post mentioned earlier, uh, which was posted on the subreddit Personal Finance Canada. It was titled, As a TD Employee, the Sales Culture is Disgusting. TD, if you aren't familiar, is one of the big five banks in Canada, also the name behind the TD Ameritrade service in the US, albeit they recently sold a big chunk of that. And in this Reddit post, the poster who claims to be a financial advisor for TD talks about how they're continually pressured to put clients into products and services that aren't inherently appropriate for their financial situation, with them highlighting a few examples. What includes a manager questioning why the advisor put a client into a GIC instead of a mutual fund, even though the client highlighted that they need the money in one year's time, with the manager suggesting they manipulate the time horizon in their system because, quote, mutual funds count more towards your quarterly goals. Another includes being scolded because he allowed a client to not renew their GIC and didn't look for, quote, investment opportunities even though, again, the client said that they needed the money for an expenditure. And while I do believe there were more examples provided, that's all we can get with the Wayback Machine uh, because the Reddit post is now actually deleted, which sadly I'm guessing is because the bank either found out about it 
or the individual was just nervous about losing their job given that the post was starting to circulate. Now, some might look at that and think, well, that's not the worst type of financial advice you come across. And that's true to an extent, but it nonetheless does demonstrate the bank prioritizing sales targets over what's appropriate for a client for a position where the client is supposed to be trusting someone for giving objective financial advice. Generally speaking, you shouldn't be investing in the stock market unless you're able to not touch that money for an extended period of time, certainly over a year. And while one might hope that this is just an anecdotal example that's not representative, not long after this post circulated on Reddit, we actually saw investigative journalist Erica Johnson over at CBC News Marketplace release an investigation on this exact topic, whereby they interviewed current and former employees and used hidden cameras to unveil some of the high pressure sales tactics being used at bank branches. And it revealed some pretty damning practices. In the interviews, employees highlighted examples where they themselves were pressured to put branch interests above their clients. We're there to sell and make money for the bank with some highlighting explicitly that they often weren't acting in the client's best interest, but rather just trying to meet their sales targets to avoid being fired. Meanwhile, with the hidden cameras, they often found advisors giving blatantly bad advice, again, to try and meet sales targets. Some told customers not to worry about investment fees or couldn't correctly explain how their fees work, even blatantly misrepresenting the fee calculation at times. At 1.9% also be taken from the 50,000? Um, it no, it's not to get from your own principal. There are also a number of advisors telling clients to invest in their high fee mutual funds, even when they had $17,000 of credit card debt they could pay off. Well, some of the stuff was honestly just as bad as what you might find online. The average interest you will get at least 10%. Right. Absolutely more than 10%. Which is not only a bad look, a lot of it's actually illegal. As highlighted in the investigation, the Canadian Bank Act explicitly prohibits a lot of this activity, highlighting that banks cannot take advantage of people, and further that banks shall not communicate false or misleading information. Which raises the question that if this is illegal, why is it still happening? Well, there, there's a few factors worth considering, but the first biggest one, which we've already touched on, is that a lot of it is just the incentives that the advisors face in terms of their compensation and their sales targets. Because as the late Charlie Munger once said, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Unfortunately for the vast majority of bank advisor roles, the work culture is heavily focused on sales and a lot of compensation can be either directly or indirectly tied to the number of products you're able to sell, either from trailing commissions, which are paid to you regularly for selling certain types of mutual funds or things like sales targets, which might not only benefit someone who say is a top performer in their bank, but can even stand as a threat to employees who don't sell enough. With a lot of employees having the fear of losing their job if they don't meet these objectives, which obviously can be a bad idea when some of those products explicitly work against a client, such as with credit card debts and high fee bank accounts, but even when it comes to investment products like GICs and mutual funds, it can cause problems when those things aren't appropriate for a given client. This applies everywhere, but it's especially true here in Canada, given that we actually have a reputation for having some of the highest mutual fund fees globally, with a recent Morningstar Global Investor Experience report highlighting a median fee of around 1.76% for equity funds without really any evidence that these funds outperform cheaper index funds. So right away, it's no surprise why we see some of these issues. Uh, but there's another problem worth considering which is that at times, advisors can be undereducated. Now, I wanna be very clear that even when it comes to bank branch advisors, this is not to claim that every individual who works in these positions is undereducated or even prioritizing their own interests over their clients. But for banks, it is much cheaper to hire salespeople with the bare minimum level of requirements and education rather than a workforce of expert financial planners. In fact, according to Glassdoor, the average base pay range in Canada for a bank advisor is 41 to $47,000. So without considering commission, the base pay is around the median Canadian salary and only marginally ahead of the high end of retail associate salaries for a position that most people would assume requires a high degree of education and expertise. But that doesn't really matter for banks. What really matters is getting employees who can bring customer money into their products. Uh, whether or not they are an expert financial planner. And in Canada, while the term advisor is technically protected and does require a degree of registration, the bar isn't particularly high, and there are plenty of different methods for becoming registered and being able to call yourself an advisor, with a common one for banks being a mutual fund dealer, meaning that the person is only legally allowed to sell mutual funds. But it leads to a lot of confusion given that both dealing representatives and advising representatives where fiduciary duty is owed can both call themselves advisors, which is a similar situation we see with broker dealers in the United States. And as mentioned by the CBC investigation, there were a number of examples where advisors didn't even understand the products that they're registered 
register to sell, which is a pretty important detail. So there's clearly some gap that exists here. So again, you can see a conflict of interest and the gaps that exist with these positions. Uh, but the final reason why, again, we still see this activity despite it being illegal, is that we haven't seen a whole lot of action to rein this stuff in. That's not to say there hasn't been any progress cracking down on conflicts of interest. In 2022, for example, with Canada banning deferred sales charges, fund companies are no longer allowed to pay an upfront sales commission for mutual fund sales. But with that CBC investigation coming out recently after these regulatory changes, there's still clearly a lot of problems. In fact, the investigation was actually a follow-up to one from roughly seven years ago, with the finding more or less a lot of the same issues. And the former investigation did prompt a review by the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada to see how bad the problem really was. And while the report did highlight that the sales practices of these banks increased the risk of mis-selling and that current controls put in place are insufficient, it didn't go far enough to claim that this mis-selling was happening at a widespread scale, with the report highlighting, quote, FCAC did not find widespread mis-selling during its review, which while could be a good thing if it means that these examples are anecdotal and not reflective of a bigger problem, that part of the report was only added after a review by the banks, which you can see the bad optics that come with that. So it's easy to see why when you have these three factors in play, how these problems are going to come to the surface. And it would be easy to look at the individuals in this circumstance, the manager from the Reddit post and the specific advisors from the CBC investigation. It's pretty clearly a more systematic issue. Something I became very aware of after graduating university is that the vast majority of finance positions out there, especially for new entrants, are sales positions. And if you want to enter the finance field, you're more than likely going to have to start in one of these roles. I was very lucky myself with the positions I had, but I recognize how rare it is to have a low pressure analyst role as a relatively young professional in the industry. And these advisors, when they start off, aren't making a killing. They're told that if they want to make more money and at times that they want to keep their job, they have to meet these targets. That's not to condone this activity, and we should certainly still criticize when we see advisors giving bad advice, given the severity of the situation and how important finances are for people. But it does help to explain why this is more of a structure issue than a few bad Apple professionals. So given all this, what should people do when they want to get explicit financial advice from a registered professional? Uh, well, obviously here, I'm going to have my own biases given that I work for a certain type of company, but there are some commonly agreed on steps that you can take when deciding to work with an advisor and some other considerations to have that should better protect yourself. For one, there's education and doing a bit of research. I understand that not everyone's going to get to the level of being a full autonomous uh, financial professional, uh, but even just doing a little bit of research into the products and uh, information that you're specifically interested in can really help you when reaching out to a professional. You have to be careful and cross-check the information you come across online, especially when it comes from forums and uh, more social media sites. But if nothing else, it'll help you prepare a list of questions you can bring up with the advisor and help you better evaluate the information the advisor provides you. Secondly, it's worth considering the credentials, the registration, the disclosures, and the incentives of the advisor that you want to work with. Again, here I'm gonna have my bias uh, but credentials do demonstrate an advisor's commitment to further education beyond the basics. Uh, I myself have the CFA and CFP, which are pretty well regarded, uh, but there's also other uh, credentials like the new CFP in Canada, which is causing some drama actually, but we also have the CIM and the PFP. Uh, other countries will have their own specific designations, but internationally, uh, the CFA and CFP are international. CPA, if you wanna work with an accountant, chartered financial consultants, which are similar to certified financial planners. And there are quite a few other well-respected designations in the field of financial advice that we can consider. All of which do have their own specialized focus, so it's worth considering that. Uh, but again, do demonstrate this education beyond the basics, as well as an adherence to a code of ethics or standards of professional conduct that typically demand further integrity beyond the minimum if these members want to maintain their designation. You can also look up an advisor to see their level of registration and any uh, disciplinary action taken against them or other disclosures such as complaints, which obviously are worth knowing about who you're gonna have manage your money. In Canada, you can see whether someone is registered as a dealing representative or an advising representative with, again, the latter having that fiduciary obligation. And in the United States, registered investment advisors and their investment advisor representatives likewise owe that fiduciary duty to their clients compared to other broker dealer and other arrangements. I'll include links for the Canadian and US websites where you can look up these details in the description below. Finally, you have a right to understand how your advisor is compensated, so it's worth asking about it to see whether they're paid a commission for the certain products they sell 
or if there's some other arrangement. Which speaking of, well, bank branch advisors obviously stand out as a first choice for many, given that we deal with banks for many other types of products. There are a lot of other alternatives to finding an advisor out there worth considering. There are credit unions which operate like banks, but might have a better incentive structure, as well as companies that focus only on uh, investment management. So there's not this sort of incentive to say, try put you into a debt product of some sort. Uh, there you can have independent wealth managers where the compensation isn't tied to the specific investments they put you in or the funds they put you in, as well as fee only planners, whereby uh, there's this flat upfront fee charged or perhaps a variable fee of some sort. But that fee is for a financial plan, which will make investment recommendations without having any compensation tied to the investments themselves. And regardless of who you move forward with, it's important to vet the company and the advisor. I'll actually include a link to this list of questions to ask your advisor from the Government of Canada's website, as I think it does a good job of covering all all the bases of what you should know going into a relationship. And I'll take a quick moment to highlight that if you only need an investment solution and not necessarily that advisor side of the business where perhaps you do have more education, there are plenty of options there as well. A part of the reason why mutual fund fees are so high is that part of that is intended to compensate the advisor for giving you advice. Uh, so you can have cheaper solutions if you strip that aspect out. That includes things like self-directed brokerages, robo-advisors where uh, there's an algorithm deciding which investments you put in, as well as many other solutions out there. And the thing is you can always switch between these options. Perhaps you don't feel like you need advice right now, you just wanna get started investing. And then later on in life, if you feel like your situation gets a bit more complicated, then you can reach out to an advisor and have more guidance on that front. And I'll leave a link in the description for finding local advisors, given that a lot of the time people just aren't aware of the vast array of options out there. Anyway, those are the steps you can do to hopefully better protect yourself. And I still am of the belief that advisors can add tremendous value to their clients. Again, a bit of uh, bias there, but uh, I think in a day and age where a lot of people are heavily undereducated when it comes to finances, there's a lot that can be gained from this professional guidance, especially for even those with a base level of understanding when you get towards more complicated situations like trusts, estate planning, tax efficiency, things of that sort where their expertise does play an important role. But it's important to identify and understand when a conflict of interest exists and what you can do to better mitigate it. So hopefully this video helped with that. If you found it did, please do make sure to like, subscribe, all the good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts on all this down below, especially if you are an advisor who works in the industry, whether it's for a bank or for another company, I'd really love to hear your input on all this. Obviously I've given my two cents, but I'd love to hear other people's opinions. Anyway, thanks for joining me today. And as always, be safe out there.